So I am um, I, it's, I'm delighted to be with you all. I'm considered a great honor to be part of this. And uh, I would like to um, just say that um, as I was planning this, I want to talk about both genetic entropy and Adam and Eve. And I think one of you, maybe um, it was you, Alexander, said, uh, well, you have 35 minutes. So, so um, it sounds pretty ambitious. And I said, oh, I can do it. And as I've gone to prepare for this presentation, I realize that in 35 minutes, <laughs> I may not finish my talk. So I, I may skip over a few slides. I'm sorry, it'll be a little bit choppy, but it's hard. Here's, here's the good news. Uh, the good news is there's so much evidence for a literal Adam and Eve that I don't have, uh, that even an hour, or two hours would not be sufficient to share that evidence with you. So, uh, so I guess having too much evidence isn't such a bad thing. Okay, so um, I love mottos, things that really capture the truth. One of my mottos is believe God more and believe man less. And I think that would, we can exhort each other actually to do that. I think that's something we could all embrace, that, that basic idea. Here's another one that I really love. Good science affirms scripture. And so 20 years ago, um, I gave up my Cornell position and I sold my biotechnology company. And I decided that I wanted to uh, this was 10 years after I was saved, and I decided I wanted to dedicate my life to Christ. And um, I thought I was leaving science, actually, at the time. Um, but very quickly, it became clear to me that um, God was calling me to use my science to defend the faith and to, um, to um, help, especially the young people who are struggling with their faith based upon things that I think are lies, powerful lies, uh, which uh, make them unable to believe. And so um, that's kind of my background. And so 20 years I've been a full-time uh, uh, full engagement in uh, the creation evolution controversy. And um, what I've found, and actually Rob Carter, my colleague has found the same thing, uh, if you look at the science, the, the, the evolutionary science, it's very um, good marketing and very persuasive until you actually dig deep. And as deeper you go, the more evolutionary science loses its credibility and its compelling nature. And so, um, so good science has helped me to overcome that stronghold, which was a stronghold in my own life, in my own mind, in my own heart. And, um, and I've been able to share with people um, evidences that would encourage them in their faith. So uh, this today's topic is restoring Adam and Eve. And so um, I'm just thinking, okay, clicking the wrong button. So Dr. Rob Carter is one of my collaborators and uh, he and I have been working since 2007 on aspects of the Adam and Eve issue. And he's a, a geneticist like myself. Um, he's really wonderful at uh, data analysis and other things. And so he's played a, a key role in some of the things I'm going to be reporting. And um, other scientists, a lot of, I've been part of a lot of collaborations uh, with a lot of really outstanding scientists as I've pursued this, this issue. And I just want to acknowledge Dr. Wes Brewer, Dr. John Baumgartner, Dr. Franzine Smith, and numerous other collaborators. So um, here's some resources. I'm not, in this short time, I can't give you all the evidence for literal Adam and Eve, but here are some evidence. The first one actually is a book in preparation, Adam, Eve, and Evidence, The Descent of Man. Uh, the second one is a book that we published a few years ago, Contested Bones. And this is about basically the supposed transitional form between man and ape. And uh, so the ch one chapter in that book, which I will be posting in the next day or two, uh, 
is on genetic evidences uh, that show that ape and man did, man did not derive from ape. And so that's a, the best synopsis I have. And so I, I, if you want something where you can just read a single chapter of a book, uh, this is the one to go to. You can go to logosra.org. And that same site, you can go to a, a still shorter a synopsis of the issues, Adam, Eve, and Evidence. And then lastly, there's a longer uh, article in light of genetics, Adam, Eve, and the Creation Fall, which was published in Christian Apologetics. So these are uh, resources for you. Some, uh, most of you don't have time to read this stuff, but uh, for those of you who do want to delve into it more deeply, these are resources for you. So uh, what is at stake if there is no Adam and Eve? Who cares? Well, I care a lot, and I think a lot of Christians care a lot. It begins with God's character. So if there was um, suffering and death and evil in the world before the fall, then how good is God? For me, the goodness of God is the beginning and the ending of my faith. And so I believe God's goodness with all my heart. And the idea that God used differential death, death of the unfit, which is the opposite of survival of the fit, that God would use that method to create uh, parasites and predators and these things doesn't fit with the character of Genesis 1 and 2, and it doesn't fit with the character of my understanding of who Christ is. So God's character is very much at stake here. Secondly, our trust in scripture. If there is no Adam and Eve, if the early chapters of the Bible are allegories or myths or just poetry, then, um, then those, um, then what, what, where do we start believing the Bible? It seems to start from Genesis 1, and that there's this clear narrative that takes us all the way to Revelation. So I just uh, think many people who say, well, okay, maybe there is no Adam and Eve, also start to down the slippery slope of disregarding all the supernatural events of the Bible. Number three, um, are we really image bearers? If, if that is all just mythology or poetry, then are we really made in God's image? Number four, uh, I would misspelling there, the meaning of the cross. Why did G Jesus have to die on the cross? Arguably, Jesus died on the cross to reverse the fall and to rescue us from the sin and death that came into the world at the time of the fall. So to deny Adam and Eve is to deny really the meaning of the cross. And lastly, um, you know, as we know that the Bible has bookends and that the beginning is the book of Genesis and at the end is the book of Revelation. And in particular, the last first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation are mirror images. And so um, if there was no fall, and if there was evil before Adam and Eve, then uh, we have to wonder what heaven will be like, or whether there will be a literal heaven, or whether heaven will just be another allegory or myth. And so these are profoundly impactful to my faith, and I believe the faith of millions of people. So this is, so Adam and Eve is a very important topic. So there is lots of scriptural evidence for Adam and Eve. And so Wayne Grudem was just mentioning that. And I just like to reiterate, the first three chapters of Genesis are foundational to the Bible. The New Testament authors quote Genesis as history, especially Genesis 1 through 11. The New Testament authors refer to the fall, the serpent, Cain, Abel, Seth, and Enoch. Jesus himself refers to Adam, Eve, Noah, the flood, and the ark. And there are twice as many references 
to Adam and Eve in the New Testament than the Old Testament. So, um, so this is, should be a big deal for anyone who takes scripture seriously. So there are five genetic evidences that I'm gonna talk about. There are other evidences, but I had need to condense this to a 35 minute presentation. So five genetic evidences I'm gonna present and genetic entry AP, I may run out of time on. So someone, um, I'll, I'll try to um, finish on time. Some basic genetic evidences uh, supporting a literal Adam and Eve include uh, evidence from mitochondrial Eve, uh, evidence from Y chromosome Adam, evidence uh, regarding the design variations that could have been in Adam and Eve, that is the genetic variants or the diversity within Adam and Eve. Uh, the next one is the refutation of a, the, all the ape to man claims. And lastly, genetic entropy. And that's the biggest one and I saved it for last because it's where we have the most data and where it has the biggest impact. Okay, so let's talk about genetic evidence number one, mitochondrial Eve. If you just Google mitochondrial Eve, it'll pop up and you will learn, let's say from Wikipedia, that uh, this person, uh, her name was not really Eve, but this, they would say was not Eve, uh, but that she is the mother of us all. And that all human beings, you know, mitochondria is this tiny little chromosome. It's a tiny part of our genome, minuscule, and it's only transmitted from the woman, not through the man. So, um, and so basically, it's acknowledged by evolutionists that she is the mother of us all in the sense that all people alive today have a mitochondrial sequence almost identical to that person. We're gonna show that we can identify Eve's sequence. So maybe Eve didn't exist, but certainly we can identify her DNA sequence. All of our mitochondrial chromosomes come from one woman. That's pretty amazing. And that wouldn't have been predicted. The data showed that that wasn't an evolutionary expectation. In fact, it blew people's minds. So Eve's mitochondrial DNA consensus sequence. So Rob and I published in 2007, a paper on, uh, we originally titled it, um, the mitochondrial Eve sequence. And they said, we'd rather you published it with a less divisive journal, uh, journal title. And so we called it mitochondrial diversity within modern human populations. And you notice my name is not there. And the, re the logic was, if my name was there, we didn't think we would be published, which is, uh, so basically creationists, I believe, were the first people to, um, to be canceled <laughs> systematically. So, um, okay, so this paper, um, was a very compelling uh, description of, of what mitochondrial Eve's sequence was. So we, we, there are some nucleotides that are still unknown, but we know approximately what her sequence was. So um, just to, so, so Rob took a database of mitochondrial chromosomes from around the world, and he aligned them all, and then he discovered uh, where the mutations were. So basically, it's, this is a little bit like, um, you, you, it's like finding a consensus sequence. If you had uh, a document and you gave it to 10 different people, and you asked them to just try to make a copy of it manually, uh, what you'd find is, all of those people would have mistakes and all of those mistakes would be unique to that person. And so you can go through and get rid of the rare deviance. And then when you subtract all the mutations, you can then know the original sequence. So this diagram is a bullseye view. We call it a divergence diagram. And at the center is the consensus sequence. So we were able to simply by getting rid of the mutations, the deviant forms of the sequence, we could reconstruct Eve's sequence quite accurately. And um, then we could compare her to all the other people. So the red dot in the middle 
is Eve sequence, and then the blue dots are you know diverge from Eve. Eve is in the past, so that's a distant point. But all the blue dots are living people today who have diverged genetically, mutationally from Eve. And so what we see is that um, there is a circle around Eve where um, everyone has diverged out of that circle. And uh, so each ring it measures is measuring 50 mutations. So you can see that most people have less than 50 mutations in their mitochondria chromosome since uh, Eve. Now we're gonna use the term Eve as not the biblical Eve, but just the mitochondrial Eve. I believe that the mitochondrial Eve and the biblical Eve are the same, but let's not jump to that conclusion. Let's just talk about mitochondrial Eve. So um, here's, here's a question. How long ago did Eve live? So on average from our data analysis, we know that there are an average uh, 21 accumulated mitomutations mutations per person. That is, you and I have about 21 mutations that are different from Eve's. So we've accumulated that amount of genetic damage. Now, the mito mutation rate is um, variable within people and depending on how people take the measurements. But um, let's say it's 0.1 mutations per generation. So it's it's low because it's a very small chromosome. So if you want to know um, how long, uh, if, if you know the mutation rate, you know the number of mutations, you can just, div um, 21 divided by 0.01 is 210 generations. In other words, in 210 generations, uh, you can diverge on, we can each have diverged about uh, 210 generations away from Eve. So if you assume that a generation is about 25 years, this means that Eve lived about 5,250 years ago, which is a very biblical date. And so that's really intriguing. Now, some people would say, well, that's not what I've heard. I've heard that Eve is maybe 100, 200,000 years old. Um, they're not using the empirical um, dating method. They're using uh, evolutionary inferences to get those numbers we're using actual direct observation of sequences and calculation of mutations, and then just understanding the mutation rate, how long it would take to accumulate uh, uh, 21 mutations. So it's really intriguing that the, using uh, the empirical approach of measuring how long ago mitochondrial Eve lived, she lived in a biblical time frame. That's pretty amazing. So let's now look at genetic evidence number two, which is Y chromosome atom. Again, you can Google Y chromosome atom. All Y chromosomes come from one man. We now have an approximation of his chromosome sequence. And uh, what we find is the, uh, there's very little variation. Um, basically all men carry the same Y chromosome with a limited number of mutations. And so there is a Y chromosome atom, but as we will see, he's very recent because there's very little variation within this chromosome. All human men have basically the same Y chromosome. So this is another diagram, divergence diagram. Now at the center, we have Adam's sequence, and then we plot uh, where, the, where modern people um, line up in terms of how far they've diverged. And so now the ring, the rings are 200 mutations. It's because we have higher mutation rates, because we have a much larger chromosome, then we have a much higher mutation rate. But again, we can see the original sequence and we can see that many people have diverged away from it. We'll see that some people have diverged more than others. Some people have twice as many mutations as others. But the point is, Everybody is diverging, and over time, they diverge further and further from the source chromosome. So how long ago did Adam live? So um, the claim dates, the traditional uh, claim is that uh, Adam lived 57,000 57, uh, years ago. Um, but we don't, um, we don't necessarily agree with those numbers. 
if we actually take the average accumulation, about men on average uh, have about 300 chromosome Y mutations different from Adam. And so, uh, but that's a big chromosome. It's something like uh, 60 million uh, nucleotides. So uh, this is a very tiny amount of mutation that has accumulated since mitochondrial not up to, to Y chromosome uh, atom. Chromosome Y has a mutation rate of about one mutation per generation. And so the time to get 300 mutations is just 300 generations. And so if we adjust, the, if we adjust for the um, fact that there's 25 years per generation, we get a date for Adam of roughly 7,500 years. And so again, um, if we, this is an empirical method of uh, how, how the dates are derived, not based upon any inferences at all. It's a direct observation. So what we see is that both Adam and Eve lived about in the same, same time frame and both lived in a very biblical time frame. So um, a lot of people would say, well, but you haven't taken into account the concept of coalescence. So um, I think coalescence um, is, it certainly happens, but I think it's being used as an evolutionary escape mechanism. So um, here's a diagram of what people imagine if um, this, what's going on. And that is, you'll see that uh, there's a, uh, we at the top in the middle, we have Adam and Eve or the most recent common ancestors. And, um, and they, they propagate in, uh, into the lower generations. And then there's these two red boxes on the left and right. And we see that there were lots of people living at the same time as Adam and Eve, but all of those lineages died out. And so that's um, what coalescence is, and it does happen, but it doesn't really work well unless there's random mating. If you have people in Africa and people in Australia um, coalesce and they're not, uh, you can't have random mating for people who spread out over the whole world. And so coalescence doesn't happen. And so the coalescence argument is really a, a, a red herring. So, um, so that's mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Now let's talk about genetic evidence number three, uh, which is de design diversity in Eden. So this has been a major challenge. Uh, Biologos has argued forcefully that uh, against an Adam, uh, literal Adam and Eve, and they've used the argument that uh, there's no way that two people could give rise to all the genetic diversity we see in the world today. And so, um, so this has uh, been asserted very um, aggressively. And yet it, they, it's pretty clear that they didn't think it through very carefully because uh, it's not as if there was no genetic diversity in Eden. So they're ignoring, they were ignoring the potential for pre-programmed diversity in Adam and Eve. You know, Adam could have had um, one allele, one of his um, genes for eye color could have been brown, and another one of his genes could have been um, blue, and so he might have had greenish eyes, and that, that's diversity. It's not from mutation. It's because God made Adam with diversity built into his genome, and likewise Eve. We we, we know that Eve was made from Adam, but we don't know that Eve's sequence was Adam's sequence. Obviously, at least in the Y chromosome, Eve did not have Adam's sequence. And so we shouldn't assume that Adam and Eve had the same sequence. We know, in fact, that they had to have different sequences. God could have easily built that in. A modern couple has about seven to eight million genetic variants so there's a huge amount of genetic diversity in any modern couple. And this is, um, Adam and Eve could have had many more genetic variants uh, by, because it's up to God. These aren't, most people think of genetic variants as mutations, but if you're believing that there was a miraculously located, uh, miraculously um, created 
Adam and Eve, you don't need to assume that all variations are due to mutations. Most of the variations are due to designed diversity. And so designed genetic diversity would be available instantly. You don't need mutations, you don't need time, and you can get all the diversity seen in the world today. So, um, so that was um, a very strong argument, but it didn't hold up. Just to show this in more clarity, um, if there's design diversity in Eden, we can ask how many chromosome sets in Eden? Because you know, normally uh, uh, the man would have one set from mom and one from dad. And Eve would have uh, one set from mom and one from dad. But since neither Adam nor Eve seem to have had parents, at least according to the scripture, um, there would have been four sets of chromosomes in Eden. So here I've drawn out the, the four sets of chromosomes, two from Adam, two for Eve. And what we see is that uh, in many nucleoside positions, each letter position, there's no variation, but there can be up to four variants. The first line that's red is, uh, or is column is TACG. And so there, there's four different genetic letters in the genetic alphabet, and there's four sets of chromosomes in Eden and so there's um, an almost infinite amount of genetic variation that could have been designed into those four sets of chromosomes. So because this was being argued forcefully and people were being told that there was proof that Adam and Eve were not real because, um, because they couldn't have created so much diversity, we spent my colleagues and I, there were six of us, we spent, um, I think we have background noise from somebody, but anyway, um, the, um, the, let's see, I'm talking about Adam Eve design diversity in low frequencies. So the, the, to refute the too much diversity uh, argument was easy. But then they challenged us with a more difficult challenge. They said, okay, you could have all that diversity. We, we, I, I don't actually haven't heard them acknowledge that, but obviously they were wrong about that. And so now they, they've gone to a higher level of uh, rigor. And they've said, okay, you can get lots of diversity by design diversity in Adam and Eve, but you can never get the allele frequencies currently seen in the human population. We did numerical simulations. We spent years doing numerical simulations. And the bottom line is we showed that allele frequencies uh, that align that our, our, our Adam and Eve scenarios, our simulations with Adam and Eve parameters was a better fit to current allele frequencies than evolutionary parameters. And so we, we, this cost us a lot of time and effort, but we did prove that that challenge was wrong. So um, genetic evidence number four is refuting ape men. Of course, when we think of Adam and Eve, the first thing we think of is, well, they must have looked something like Homo erectus. They must have, you know, they must have been like ape ape men. And then they and then people think, well, there must have been ape men. So obviously there wasn't uh, Adam and Eve. But actually, we've published a book in the last few years that I think is really compelling. It's a creation perspective of the hominin transitional forms or the hominin um, bones. And basically, uh, five years of research, Chris Roop and I invested in this. We show that the transitional ape to man bones do not hold up to scrutiny, and the missing links are still missing. Okay. So here are my main points, uh, the main points of this book. The bones are still contested. Uh, genetically, it's impossible to go from ape to man for, for the reasons we're gonna describe. So I'd just like to apologize that, um, that I didn't plan this out carefully enough. 30 minutes goes by really fast, <laughs> especially when it, there's a lot of information. The bottom line is that um, in terms of contested bones, um, 
the bones are usually either simply apes, they're mixed bone beds where they're the same bone, uh, bone uh, collection collects, has both ape and humans in them. There are inbred humans that have undergone uh, uh, severe inbreeding wherever there's highly isolated tribes. Um, people degenerate. And so Erectus, Hobbit, Man, and Naledi, two of the three of the, three of the major uh, supposed transitional forms to man, they've all been now shown to be um, suffering from inbreeding and from, um, and they're all very small and they're all very sick. Not, they're not subhuman, they're humans with pathology. And lastly, the dating methods uh, consistently proved to be um, subject to, uh, to um, correction. So um, all of the claims that have been offered by the evolutionary community are, are, dis, are proven to be wrong in the, seventh, in the 13th chapter of this book, including the uh, chromosome two fusion has been refuted. Uh, and um, so this is something maybe uh, I can share with you if you want more of this information. And then a very exciting book coming out, More Than a Monkey, from a, a very high level genomicist. He's coming to the same conclusions we are, and that is that there's vast difference between humans and chimps genetically. Um, genetic entropy, we won't be able to discuss, although I thought I was gonna spend most of my time on that. And um, I'll just invite you to explore that with me during the questions and answers period. 